Heaven is important to me. Is it to you? I have a personal and an explicit working faith. All of grace. But my faith is in a personal Savior. He gave me a personal invitation to a supper up yonder. And by His grace, I'm going to make it and I'll be in my place. Because He saved me. I have a personal Savior whom I've never seen. But I have a, an imminent personal expectation of seeing Him and hoping to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And I have a personal investment in heaven as well. I was taught a long time ago by my father and mother to send materials on up ahead. And that's what we've been trying to do. And God knows for between 40 and 50 years of ministry now, we've been seeing people go on up ahead of us. And they're there waiting for us. That's it. It's, it's not the shore on the other side of the river that I'm looking forward to seeing. I'm looking forward to seeing the one that's on the shore. The Lord Jesus and all of the loved ones that have gone on before. And because of that, I think of a, of a chorus that we have sung around here. With eternity's values in view. With eternity's values in view, that puts a whole new spin on this business of everyday living, doesn't it? I'm not living for myself. I'm not living for what I can gain or for what I can get. I'm not living for, for my earthly business. This is, this is just part of keeping body and soul together down here while we serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. This life of mine is not my own. I'm bought with a price. I've been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm looking forward to seeing Him, but in the meantime, there's something He wants us to to do for Him. Don't get too comfortable. Because this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. You know, we deal with a lot of prisoners, and a famous prisoner was asked why he never was a recidivist, he never committed the crime again to go back inside a second time. And he said, unlike a lot of inmates, I did not do something that they do. And the answer is this. He did not decorate his cell. Because he never com considered his cell to be his home. He considered it his punishment. And he couldn't wait to get out of there and get back to his real home. Now, I want to tell you right now, this world is a time of testing and proving, isn't it? It's a time of challenges and difficulties. And those people that want to embrace everything about this life, and everything that is, that is material, and everything that is temporal, and, and say it's valuable, just haven't got a glimpse of what's over on the other side. What's over on the other side is worth everything. My Savior, Jesus Christ, there is that better home, there is that place called heaven. I'm going there. I'm going to see my loved ones. I'm going to see my Savior. And Jesus is what will make it heaven for me. The writers of the New Testament did not talk so much about going to heaven as going to be with Jesus. And someone has said, a dog is at home in this world because it's the only world the dog will ever live in. We are not at home in this world because we're made for a better one. If for no other reason, come back tonight to hear Ray Cabana sing. He's going to sing, I hope, sing down from his glory. That great song placed to that beautiful piece of classical music. Down from His glory, ever-living story, my God and Savior came and Jesus was His name. Born in a manger to His own a stranger, a man of sorrows, tears, and agony. Oh, how I love Him, how I adore Him, my breath, my sunshine, my all in all. The great Creator became my Savior and all God's fullness dwelleth in Him. You better get your reservation. You better get your reservation. Have you made it yet? Our home is called many things. And Peter, in 1 Peter 1.4, says that we've, we've been saved to an inheritance which is one incorruptible, two undefiled, three that fadeth not away, four that's reserved in heaven for us. Jesus Christ did that for us. And heaven is sounding sweeter all the time. We have that blessed hope. It is not just rhetoric to say, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because everything we have that's worth anything is in Jesus Christ. And so in this life, 
We live His life. He lives through us. The life that He would have us to live, and it's worthwhile. And then when we get over on the other side, we find out what it's really all about. It'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. We sang that this morning. I'm glad for the bulletin. I'm glad for the song service. I'm glad for all of it. Now, is there a heaven? People ask. What can we count on? Let me explain this verse by verse. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul was writing to the Corinthian believers. They had all kinds of problems that he addressed. One of their difficulties was that they were not quite clear on what had happened to their saved loved ones who had passed. They wondered if they'd ever see them again. And so Paul writes by inspiration to clarify that yes, indeed, they will see them again. In addition to what we've read in 1 Thessalonians 4, I want you to read with me now in 1 Corinthians 15. Please follow as I read beginning at verse number 19. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. We have hope beyond the grave. We are not miserable. But, I like that, now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. I believe that. He was the first one to rise from the dead to never die again. For since by man, that's Adam, came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead, by Jesus Christ. So think about that. The first Adam was the one responsible for introducing sin into this world. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, introduces new life. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. That is, if they'll receive the free gift. He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at His coming, that's the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in two parts. First, the rapture. He comes for the saints. We've read about that. We're caught up to meet Him in the air. Then He comes back with His saints at the Battle of Armageddon, the second coming proper. That's good eschatology. And at His coming. Then cometh the end when He shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. So after that, He delivers up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when He shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Now this is a wonderful and blessed truth in verse 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Great news! King death is going to be destroyed by the greater king, King Jesus. And so that's why he wrote to us and said, I, will not, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Their bodies are asleep in the grave. Don't sorrow as others. You may sorrow, but not as others because we've got something. We've got a hope beyond the grave. If we believe that Jesus did that for us, then we're going to rise too. And, and the dead will rise first. Then we will rise when the, that shout, that voice, that trumpet sounds. And we'll have glorified bodies. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And this is great comfort. Praise God for the fact that when we're alive at His coming, we're going to participate in that rapture. And we're going to, I don't know what all we're going to see. I don't know how fast it's going to take place, if it's all going to be a blur. But wow, think of it. We're going to be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Everything down here that people have scratched and scraped for is going to seem so small. So tiny, so insignificant, so unimportant. As we are raised and as we are transformed together, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time for all eternity. Now here are some frequent, frequently asked questions. Do saved people recognize each other in heaven? You ever asked that or been asked that? Okay. Why don't you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And then we'll apply some other scripture to this as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the great agape charity love chapter. All right, it says in verse number 12, For now we see through a glass darkly. So our existence right now has limited, restricted vision. Now I know in part we have restricted knowledge. But then... Later on, 
shall I know even as also I am known. Great verse, a great promise. People who have lost their loved ones to the grave are concerned that they'll never see them again or they won't be recognizable. It won't be the same. It just won't be. And 1 Corinthians answers these questions, makes it plain. The person and the character of Jesus Christ was still recognizable after His own glorification. Now, it was true that those two on the road to Emmaus and the disciples and the followers of Jesus were not expecting to see Him in those locations, and so they were a little surprised. But there was something about His presence that their eyes were opened. And don't you believe that we are going to be at least as sensitive and aware as those two on the road to Emmaus were when their eyes were opened to the presence of the Lord Jesus? I believe that today. I don't think I'm going to have to walk down a long road, sit down, hear my Savior return thanks for the broken bread, and then have my eyes opened. I believe the instant, the instant the rapture takes place, I'm going to have open eyes. I believe I'm going to have a spiritual awareness. And I'm going to recognize others. And I, likewise, will be recognized on the other side. There will be those characteristics that will be observable. We will know then even as we are known. Our eyes will be opened to Jesus and to others. The marks of individuality, though transformed, though glorified, our bodies are undeniably who we are. So if you were hoping that you would be totally different, I can't promise you that. I can promise you that you won't have your aches and your pains. I can promise you that you won't have the defects that may be there in the body and everybody's got them. But we will be recognizable. I want you to go to the oldest written statement on the subject on the planet. And you have it in your laps before you. Turn in the Old Testament to the book of Job. The book of Job. Chapter 19. Job chapter 19. Job was written, we believe, even before the Pentateuch. Some think it may have been written down by Moses. We don't know who wrote it. But we know that it is the oldest writing that we have. And in Job chapter 19, I want you to see what he said as he went through all of those difficulties that he faced. Job 19, beginning at verse 23. Job 19, 23. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. Well, Job, guess what? <laughs> they got to be printed. That they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. Here it is. For I know, K-N-O-W, that my Redeemer liveth, and that He shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and that, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, Yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. He was saying, though I physically return to dust, there is coming a time when I will see my Redeemer in my body, with my eyes, I'll behold Him. This oldest manuscript of all the books of the Bible, the oldest of any kind that we have, whether sacred or otherwise, we know that he had a confidence that he would see his Redeemer and that he would be raised and he would have a glorified body. He didn't have a Bible. He didn't have any of the advantages that we have. He had the light that God gave him. And we have the whole Bible, 66 books. Do you know how many passages tell us about heaven? Tell us about what we're going to have, what we're going to enjoy, who's going to be with us. Are you aware of the fact that the Bible is largely about that? That Jesus spoke about it. That the apostles spoke about it. The Old Testament writers spoke about it. Yet in my flesh, Job says, shall I see God whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my, though my range, my heart, be consumed within me. He had assurance. He's got more assurance without the Bible than many of us who have a Bible or many copies of the Word of God in our homes. We need to get into the Word of God until the Word of God gets into us. 
The reason people waver and are weak in their faith is because they've gotten away from the book instead of reading it. I'm so sick and tired of hearing preaching, so-called preaching on the radio and hearing about preaching on television that's not Bible-based. There's no, there's no exposition. There is no authority in that. My opinion means nothing, but what God says means everything. Will I know other people? Will they know me in heaven? Absolutely. I shall know him. I shall know him. And redeemed by his side, I shall stand. I shall know him. I shall know him by the prince of the nails in his hand. People might say, well, I'm going to be bored in heaven. I'm not sure I want to go. I'm not going to be bored in heaven. Not at all. Put this down. Number one. Heaven is a place of reordering. Heaven is a place of reordering. It's a place where the priorities that we should have gotten right down here, but didn't for whatever reason, will be made right. It says in Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The will of God is done in heaven. You remember, Jesus, as He taught the disciples to pray, said, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The will of God is done in heaven. It may not always be obeyed on earth, but it will be obeyed in heaven. Things that are not right here will be made right there. There's not one bit of envy there. There's not one bit of greed up there. There's not one bit of sadness or sorrow up there. Not one tear will be shed. Not one heartache will be felt. Not one loss or problem will be experienced. It's a place where the will of God is done. There will not be one ounce of my pride or yours. Things will be made perfect. That's why Jesus said, if we finally get it right, if we get it God's way down here, if we're walking and talking and living by the grace of God, we can live on earth as it is in heaven in the sense that we can be doing the will of God down here. Not only is it a place of reordering, number two, it's a place of rejoicing. A place of rejoicing. It says over there in Luke chapter 15, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one lost soul that repents. One person that comes to God. Now I don't know who's doing all the rejoicing, but it's in the presence of the angels. So if it's in the presence of the angels, I think that probably narrows it down to your loved ones and my loved ones. My dad's having a time right now. My grandparents are having a time right now. Those uncles and aunts of mine that have gone on before, they're having a time over there on the other side. And they're praising Jesus. And they're not bored in the least. And every time they hear about one getting saved down here at Central Baptist Church, every time they hear about somebody getting right with God, every time a tear is shed and somebody comes to God weeping, someone comes repenting, someone comes getting it right with God, there's a party going on in heaven. They're having a good time up there right now. I want my dad to have a good time. I'm sure he is. Eternal bliss. And so I'm going to do everything I can. My, my mom, every week of my life, she says, how many have you led to Christ this week? How many folks have gotten saved in the ministry? She wants to know. She wants to know. I don't think that's going to change one bit when she passes over. She's 101. When she passes over, when her time comes to go, do you think that she's going to be less interested in souls there than she is here? And I want my mom and my dad and my grandparents... To have a good time. Praise God! I want them to rejoice. And we ought to get a little bit of that down here too. Amen. Amen. So you're going to be bored in heaven? Not me. Not me. Everything that I didn't get right down here is going to be made right there. And the rejoicing that I should have started down here, it's certainly going to continue up there. And number three, it's a place of rewards. After, after we're raptured. According to 1 Corinthians 3 and 2 Corinthians 5, we're going to stand in the presence of the Lord and our works are going to be judged for rewards. Not for our salvation. We're already saved. We're already there. But to determine certain things. Crowns that will be cast at Jesus' feet. During our life here in this age of grace, this church age, 
we're serving the Lord, and if we've served faithfully, we'll have a place in the kingdom someday. As we come back with King Jesus at the battle of Armageddon, and as we are victorious together, and as He sets up kingdom upon the earth for 1,000 years, guess what? Our service here and now will determine our position there and then. I want to serve the Lord. I want to be faithful. Let's start with simple things. After being saved, and I trust that you've been saved, but if you haven't been, you can be before you leave today. Have you followed the Lord in scriptural believers' baptism? Have you joined the local church? Have you gotten busy for God? Are you serving with the gift or gifts imparted to you by the Holy Spirit the moment you were saved that you need to discover and develop and serve Him with? Uh, have, you, have you been faithful in the matter of stewardship, of giving? Because we can never outgive the Lord. Have you been faithful in reading the book that people died for that we might have the Bible? Have you been reading your Bible? Have you been praying? Have you been trusting God and seeing victories won? Have you been, have you been part of God's great program down here? Or have you just been kind of sitting around? Kind of seems to me that you're the bored ones, not the folks in heaven. If we're not doing what God wants us to do, let me ask you, why are we still here? Why are we still serving? Why are we still living? If God's got a plan for us, that's why we're still here. God's got a program. And so it's a time of rewards, and praise God for that truth. And then fourthly, it's a place of no restrictions. We're kind of tethered down here. In heaven, now I know this sounds silly, but I can be like Jesus. I can walk through walls. I can be somewhere in the speed of thought. But in many, many, many ways, I'm, I'm somewhat limited. There are so many things I've never seen and will never see. In all likelihood, my worldwide traveling days are over. So there are places on earth that I've never seen. And people say, oh, it's beautiful. Down over here or over yonder this way or that way. There are beautiful things you've never seen. Yes, beautiful things. But let me remind you, we are looking at a fallen creation through fallen eyes. Now I want you to try to imagine a renewed, restored creation. With perfect, unfallen eyes. Now, add to that unrestricted travel at the speed of thought for eternity you may wonder why we've got a universe God has created that so that for eternity we're going to be able to enjoy the wonders of everything that God is and has done for us it'll be ceaseless activity without the restrictions of time and space that these mortal bodies experience. I'm not going to be dragged down by my limitations. And best of all, Satan is going to be gone forever. First bound for a thousand years before he's loose for a little season at the end of the thousand years and then at the great white throne judgment cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet will be. And will precede him. And he will be there forever and ever and ever in the lake of fire. With all of those that are not redeemed. He'll be there forever. He'll be gone. The world system will not be as it is today. Everything will be reordered. A perfect creation. And I will not have to contend with the worst part right now. The worst part is me. I won't have to deal with my old nature, Adam's nature, the carnal part of me, and the carnal part of you will no longer weight you down. Going to be in heaven forever with the Lord Jesus. And I know there are no clocks, there are no calendars. And so when I say for a million years, it's just, I'm just speaking poetically. There are no years, there are no days, there are no hours. It's just timeless eternity. But if there were time, I'd want the first million years just to gaze on Jesus. Because He's what makes it heaven. And after a few of those million year things, then I'm looking forward to number five, a grand reunion. Grand reunion. 
The old preacher said there's three surprises in heaven. First of all, you'll be surprised at seeing people there you didn't think were going to be there. They got saved and they got there. <laughs> Secondly, you'd be surprised for the people that didn't. They didn't because they weren't really saved. Number three, the old preacher said, most everybody would be surprised to see me. Three surprises in heaven. I don't know. That doesn't do much for my ego, but that's pretty much the truth summed up in humor. Not one of us deserves to go to heaven. But the reality of heaven will make a difference in how we think and live now. If heaven isn't getting sweeter and sweeter for you, if you're worried about, what am I going to do? Twiddle my thumbs for eternity? you got a problem, sir. you got a problem, ma'am. Heaven's going to be wonderful beyond our ability to describe it. And he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You can come to Jesus for the first time today and be saved the Bible way and know for sure that heaven is your home and have that joy that will fill your soul. Or it may be that today you've kind of lost that joy. You kind of walked away from the good stuff spiritually. And you need a renewal. And let me tell you, this is the place. Now is the time. And we are the people. So what's holding us back? We need to get all excited all over again about Jesus. About heaven. About being saved. And looking forward to it. And then, that should be our motivation for right living. He bought me with His blood. I should be willing to surrender my heart and life, my thoughts, my words, my deeds, my attitudes to Him. And that's where some of us will come down today at the invitation. Would you stand with heads bowed and eyes closed? You've been viewing a service at Central Baptist Church. We never dismiss the service without clearly presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is, that Jesus came to this earth and sinlessly lived for 33 years before He voluntarily gave His life. He died on the cross, He was buried, He rose from the dead, and He's alive forevermore. Through the shedding of His blood and through His victory at uh, the, the empty tomb, Jesus Christ now offers salvation to you. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you pray right now from your heart to God and ask Him to save you? Something like this, dear God, just pray, dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I deserve to pay for my sins. I deserve to pay for my sins. I believe Jesus died to save me. I believe Jesus died to save me. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Did you pray that prayer? Did you mean it? Wonderful. I want you to get in contact with us and let us know of your decision. Now, if you've already been saved, I want to encourage you to live the life that God would have you to live according to His Word. If you desire more instruction, more information, we'll be happy to supply it to you. We'd like to talk to you. The information is right here, and we'd love to speak to you. If you have any spiritual needs whatsoever, may God bless you.